Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, which is lasting a lot longer than we all thought it would, actually. Um, and Daisy was one of my first guests. So this is webinar number 119, and I'm pretty much scheduled all the way through November. We're going to take a little break at Thanksgiving. We're going to take a break at Christmas, but we're just going to keep rolling out these webinars because you, the audience, have been so fantastic. and and I keep getting amazing feedback. And just the other day we did a bidding webinar and that just got a huge amount of feedback. So um, we're having Natasha, who's actually the owner of the school where Stephanie went to come back and do a second webinar on bidding. So I'm really looking forward to that. And we just keep adding, I have, I have some guests that I've been trying to lasso for a while. Um, <laughs> some of them are easier than others, but I know I'm gonna get there. Um, so I'm always trying to expand the topics we have um, Karen Rolfe coming tomorrow to talk about uh, her experience with dressage. And um, I'm doing a Surefoot webinar on Thursday this week because Friday I, I have to be out of town. Um, today, of course, my guest is Daisy Ficking. This is your third webinar with me, isn't it, Daisy? Yes. Um, yeah. And Daisy and I have, um, we met in Pennsylvania. She came to, to learn to ride, to, not to learn to ride, she knew how to ride, but did some lessons with me. And that was, I don't even know how long ago that was. Well, we just talked about this last time. I think we, we do pre-Rowan or post-Rowan, right? Oh, Rowan's right. 11, yeah. right? So yeah. it just feels like I've known you forever and you've I been know. one of my mentors and friends forever. So, you know. So, so anyway, this is going to be like chatting with a friend. And of course, uh, we both uh, go up and, and help out at Misty Meadows up in Massachusetts, which is a nonprofit that um, helps the people on the island, uh, people who are artistic and everything. And so we share that commonality now too. We've we both love Misty Meadow. So thank you, Daisy, for, for uh, joining me tonight. And um, just for those people who don't know you very well, can you just give us a little bit of like how you got here and doing what you're doing today? Because it's really quite amazing. Yeah, thanks. So um, like, like a lot of us, you know, um, getting started with hoof care was based on one of my own horses whose feet fell apart and put me on a path of learning everything I could about feet. And through studying with some amazing professionals over the years, um, you know, your education develops. And I've just been a student of the horse avidly uh, for the last 16 years. Um, in 2007, I was fortunate enough to um, be able to acquire my own digital radiograph machine. And that really catapulted my education because I was able to get objective feedback every time I um, needed to see what was going on inside the foot, certainly not for diagnostics. It was for, um, you know, trim guidelines, shoe in placement, basically a fancy measurement device, but it gave me a immediate objective feedback about my work. So that helped me really appreciate when the horse is telling us something that's going on in the foot and how to interpret it accurately. Um, so, you know, because of that, I felt inspired to teach and um, started um, the Daisy Haven Farm School of Integrative Hoof Care, which I've been teaching since 2009. And um, it's just evolved from there and been a fantastic journey so far. So, well, Daisy, had you done any teaching before that? Not, no. Mm -mm. But your husband's a teacher. Correct. Yeah. And I've always been like the mediator type and a, a person who likes to communicate effectively. And I love learning. And so it kind of was natural for me. And I was really inspired to share the benefits of that radiograph machine with other health care providers and other horse owners. Well, because, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that I think you're a natural teacher. And, you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of information, but not everybody's really good at communicating that information. And I recognize that because that's, you know, um, that's what I do. Um, and I think that's why we hit it off because we were both good communicators and right for like the that. Yeah, I know. It was like, <laughs> that was always the way it was. It was like brain dumped every time we saw each other. Um, but, you know, and I've watched you start, you know, from back there and just really blossom. And, and the other thing, and, and it's, it's one of the things that I think makes my teaching so good is your enthusiasm and joy of what you do. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that have information, but they're either stingy in the way they impart it, or they're just, you know, it, it takes a certain personality to be a good presenter. Um, and, 
that's one of the things that I think has made you so successful and so popular is because every webinar you've done and, and every time I've talked to you, you're really good at explaining things and keeping it simple, but clear and thorough. And, you know, that's just um, something that makes it really special. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. <laughs> that makes me so happy. You know, I just like to talk about things that are close to my heart. And so when other people appreciate that, it's like, wow, this is exciting for them. Like it's exciting for me. So yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. And I'm not the only one saying that because people in the chat are agreeing with me. <laughs> oh, yay. Thanks, everybody. I'm so glad that everybody enjoys it. I really love doing it. So, you know, it's a win-win-win, right? It shows. And that's the thing is when we love what we're doing, you know, do what you love and love what you're doing and everything kind of falls into place. All right. So tonight you're going to talk to us about posture and balance and then um, glue on shoes, right? A little bit. Yeah. About how it all relates. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got a presentation? Yeah, may I share my screen? Yep. Oh, yeah, I didn't make you. Hang on, I gotta make you co host. Do, do. Thank you. There you go. All set. Thank you. Okay. Hit share and now I'll hit play. There we go. Can you see that okay? Yep. Okay. So, Wendy asked me to help with this webinar tonight. And of course, I always say yes to Wendy because she always has such great ideas. And so um, we talked about what we wanted to talk about and very quickly this just kind of blurted out and I was like, yeah, okay, yes, this is great. Because this, this is a topic that for Wendy and I, brings us very close together. Yep. You know, why would we want to observe how the horse is standing around? Um, and, and for me right away, when I think about why do I look at posture, I go to this immediately. What a cool slide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, this goes back to Dr. Bowker's work, right? I, I learned this from Bob and thinking about how tiny all the microcirculation is in our body and the horse's body. And of course, especially in, in my world and area of focus, the horse's foot. And, you know, thinking about posture, you might not immediately think about circulation and micro vessels, but when we think about chronic wear and tear on our bodies or the breakdown of the horse's foot, and, you know, Wendy, certainly, you, you know, from the moment that you helped me unlock my frozen shoulder, right? Remember that? Yeah. And you help me remember that my shoulder blade has to move. Yeah. Right. Well, of course, if this isn't moving, then there's minimal circulation or lack of positive perfusion here. And it's going to cause, you know, compensation problems. So my belief about what I should be doing with the horse is helping them comp compensate as minimally as possible in a detrimental way to for domestication, right? For the things we do with them over time. So I've learned to look at, at the postural aspect from, from this perspective of promoting healthy circulation, benefits of nutrients, oxygen, all these sorts of fabulous things to these cells throughout the body. Because when we're not standing well, we're, we're compensating and not, it's not flowing, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm just I'm just fascinated by the foot human foot image of all the little blood vessels that are down there. Great. I mean, we know that there's blood vessels down there because our foot is pink, um, but to see that that picture is really profound. Um, yeah. It just it just great illustrations. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I love the the picture in the middle because if you we think about a micron and that these these tiny tiny blood vessels can be you know, less than one micron in diameter. And a human hair, the average human hair is 70 microns. And then if you think about a piece of pollen is 30 microns. So relatively this bigger circle than the smaller circle of the pollen, the micron is relatively that tiny, but think about how small a human hair really is. And then it all gets smaller from there. And that's where my brain just goes yeah. like, yeah, tiny. What's the, okay, here's the quiz of the day. What's the size of a red blood cell? Ooh, I don't know that one. Okay. You might want to add that into your picture. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. What is it? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. Let me, I'm let me sure take somebody a note of that. look it up while we're talking. Somebody, okay, go out to Google, find out what is the size of a red blood cell. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's what makes all those vessels red. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. That's right. So to me, thinking about posture, I'm thinking about, Perfusion of circulation. 
Oh, okay. I don't know. That that's, sense? that's a really interesting way to think of it as, um, because if there's constriction showing up in posture, then you're going to have reduced blood flow. Correct. Yeah. And then you'll have lack of nutrients, lack of oxygen, um, inability to remove waste effectively and efficiently, all those things. So, and we see that directly in the foot, right? When the foot distorts and you have um, collapsed heels, crushed heels, weak back of the foot, laminitis, um, you know, thin soles, thrush, these are circulatory problems. Okay, we got an answer. Okay, what is it? <laughs> the average red blood cell is six to eight microns. That makes sense because your major blood vessels have to be bigger for the red and the white blood cells to go through. And the white blood cells, I think, are bigger. Yeah. Um, and then it's your micro vessels that are so tiny, but they carry the oxygen and the nutrients and eliminate the waste. So if your micro vessels aren't flowing well, the whole system, that's 74% of our body wow. and the horse's body, I would imagine. Is, is yeah, I would think it's about a same percentage. Why not? Is micro vessels. Yeah. So when I'm thinking about how I'm trimming the foot and how I'm, you know, applying a prosthesis, if necessary, meaning a shoe or a boot or whatever, what I'm looking at is equalizing the load as much as I can in the horse's posture so that they get equal perfusion in their foot and they can grow a healthy foot and have good structure. Okay, now I might be jumping ahead of the game, but you know, we've got posture, which is sort of the position of the body, but we have Feldenkrais term, coined the term axure, meaning movement. Right? Yes. So movement is so critical to blood flow and you know yes. fusion and everything that just standing is kind of the worst thing we can do. Right, right. So, you know, I think it comes down to how much influence is movement versus how much influence is posture. And I have some ideas about that. Okay. We'll get to. Right. Okay. So the things that impact what the foot looks like in particular, since that's what I'm here to talk about kind of from my direction, is the conformation of the bone, right? All coffin bones are made relatively similarly, but they have individual conformational characteristics. Some are cuppier than others, some are a little bit longer than others, but they all have to be about the same size and shape to be a coffin bone, right? The weight of the horse, so a draft horse is going to have a different influence on the structure of their foot based on the weight and gravity than a pony, right? And then all those other things that influence it, like for me, the trim or the prosthetic device, plus the environment, the diet, um, you know, the horse's job, all those things, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of characteristics that, that affect that. Um, but why would looking at posture be important predominantly? And, and to me, it comes down to that horses in our domesticated environment stand around a lot, right? And yep. so when the, the movement abnormalities, they really only affect them when they're moving. And we know from studies from um, Brian Hampson that if you put GPS trackers on uh, Brumby horses in Australia, that they move an incredible amount. 16 miles a day. Wow. I think I might be mixing that up with kilometers, but it's, it's a lot. Okay. Um, and when you put GPS trackers on our domesticated horses, they don't move that much at all. And in order for them to actually move similarly to the wild Brumby horses, the feral horses in Australia, that they would actually have to have pastures he figured out that were at least 40 acres. Wow. So how many of us have pastures for our horses that are 40 acres? Not in the Northeast, maybe like out West, Midwest, you know, they have bigger uh, ranch horse, you know, right. areas, right? But most of us, you know, you're lucky if you have a five acre pasture, right. I mean, that'd be tons. And so the horses really aren't moving that much. So um, postural abnormalities affect the horse predominantly when they're standing, right? We think about like high, low feet and the foot that's high is the foot that's back and the, the foot that's low is the foot that's forward. And that's because that's how they spend their time. Right. Right. How their, how their stance is when they're grazing or, or eating or whatever. Like that center picture of that bay horse. Right. Exactly. Like the foot that's forward closer to his nose would be the flat foot and the foot that's back. And that's because of circulation. Right. right. If the, the foot that's back he he's unloading his heel a little bit 
And so the, there's the same amount of blood going into that foot and he's perfusing the back of the foot more than under the toe, which is taking the load and the pressure, right? How much load does it take if you take your finger and put it on your arm? How much lo load, I'm saying load, but pressure, does yep. it take to blanch out your arm, capillary refill? Not much. Not much at all. Mm -hmm. So think about that horse's load on its toe. It's compressing the circulation there. So it's not receiving as much oxygen, nutrients, blood, and then the back of the foot's receiving more, so it's growing faster. So the heel grows taller. Mm. Okay. The Good. opposite is the, is the case on the flat foot. The flat foot's out front, sticking out. They're pushing on that heel, so the the blood circulation is being compressed out of that heel, and more blood is perfusing the toe, so it grows faster. So the goal would be to get the horse to eat in a truly like Egyptian feeding stance and that they would switch symmetrically. How we get them to do that, I think is part of what Wendy, you and I work on all the time with yeah. Shorefoot and Feldenkrais work and trimming and all those things, right? So somebody's asking, um, the, does thrushy pain equal excessive heel growth? And uh, Does thrushy, what? Yeah, it, that, that's thrushy pain equal excessive heel growth, but I think there's a little bit of confusion there. Yeah, no, thrush is like, um, is an infection, and that can happen for a lot of reasons if the horse's immune system isn't good, um, but it can also just happen due to environment or lack of nutrition or just opportunistic bacteria at the wrong time. Right. Okay. So that, I think, is not posturally dependent. Right. Okay. So, you know, Dr. Shoemaker, who is another one of my wonderful mentors, uh, Dr. Judith Shoemaker here in Nottingham, Pennsylvania, she coined the phrase goat on a rock. And, you know, one of the things that she taught me was looking at um, the most common compensatory posture that we commonly see has some variation of base narrow, right? Goat on a rock. And Wendy, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about the same things. I mean, this these are, these are nice ways of conceptualizing these ideas, but they're, they're things we recognize in our horses, right? Right. So, you know, long toes and low heels are quite prevalent in a lot of our horses. I mean, I, I work to correct that a lot in the work that I do. Um, and that abnormal configuration um, puts leverage on the back of the leg, the soft tissue in the back of the leg. And that signals to the horse that they're standing uphill. And then because they're a quadruped and not a biped, they park their hind end up underneath themselves. So they don't fall flat on their face because they're not really standing uphill. Right. Okay. Yeah. The uphill part. So explain that a little bit more. Like why is it that it triggers the nervous system to think that it's standing uphill? Because there's leverage on the toe. So if you were actually standing uphill, right, right, you would have leverage on the front of your foot. And if you all do this at home, Put your toes up, Wendy, I, I use short foot pads for this all the time. We take the wedges, right? Yep. And we use this as an exercise. So you put your toes on a wedge, like on a door frame or a book or something, you're going to feel your body automatically lean forward to yeah. counterbalance, yes. right? Absolutely, so horse, all the time. Right. So the horse doesn't understand my toes are long. It just knows that the proprioceptive information it's getting is that it's standing uphill, so it better lean forward. Yep. But because it's not really standing uphill, the counterbalance of its head would make it fall flat on its face. Yep. So then it parks the hind end up underneath itself and throws its weight backwards to counterbalance. So it's and, like- Yeah, it lifts the head, hollows the back. Yep. Yeah. Yep, got yeah. it. Okay. Thanks. I just needed that little bit of clarity. I, I see it all the time, but I just needed the words. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Right, so this is neutral stance. So neutral stance is the most energy efficient, right? It puts the horse into um, the way I've been taught, stabilizing muscles. So it can stand here for hours, lock out its stay apparatus, fall asleep this way with, without expending much energy. Like it's just energy efficient. Where when the horse doesn't stand this way, and they stand goat on a rock, like the, like the chestnut horse here, this is very energy expensive. They have to use a lot of muscles inappropriately to hold themselves up. 
And so we see a lot of fatigue lines on the horses, like those big cut lines on the hind end of the horse. Yep. Right. So why would a horse use its muscles that way if it, if it doesn't need to, right? Like it shouldn't have cut lines on its hind end to me if it's just standing at rest. And, when and you, you may really see some on some genetically predisposed horses. There are some quarter horses that the, the muscling itself and the fascia, I think, causes that. But, but I get your point that yeah. when For you start horses, to see tight hamstrings and that sort of thing, and you look at the angle of the cannon bone being so far underneath the horse, you know that there has to be a lot of work because they're not actually able to, to use their skeleton in a way that's standing square. Right. And when we talk about this, a horse that's square, when right. we mean by square, we really mean rectangular. <laughs> yes, I know. It is rectangular. You're right. Yeah. Um, it depends yeah. on if you're drawing the square. Well, no, it's still rectangular, but yes. Um, but, yeah. you know, or a leg at each corner. And this is something yeah. that, like you say, I look at all the time with sure foot pads to see and see changes where horses are not standing with their leg coming down to the ground straight. And then, right. there's, like you say, they're either on their forehand or they have to tighten their, gl their glutes or hamstrings to be able to counter that. And um, yeah, so, sorry. No, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you and I first met, I, I was early on in this journey and it's like, it's just like the fireworks. You, t you, t we were the two of us, we were just like, yeah, and this, and do you see that? And do you see this? And yeah, yep. you know, it's been a happy ending ever after, right? Yeah. So, you know, how do we get this input about how to stand, right? And of course, feet are a big part of that um, because that's our connection to the ground with gravity but it's also all that, you know, inner ear, the vestibular system, the TMJ, you know, for the horse, the, the dental yeah. balance is super important. You know, one of the things I look at when I go to um, see a horse for um, a consultation, the owners laugh at me because one of the first things I do is look at the incisors. And, you know, if the incisors are out of balance, then technically there's probably problems further back. And, you know, I bring it up to the owners, like, you know, maybe you need some fancy dentistry just because it's gonna impact my ability to do an effective job because of how much this is innervated for balance, right? Well, and also, you know, that's where we had Jillian Kreinbring talk about the hyoid apparatus and she right. came back and talked about the occipital joint and, you know, we've had um, the equisoma folks. And the thing is that the, what you're seeing in the jaw and in the teeth is a reflection of a, a pattern that's going to run through the entire body. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, there's these, these little entry points, these little spots that we can look at that give us huge clues about what we may observe later and lead us to start paying more attention in certain observations to see if that is the case. Absolutely, yeah. Which is why I feel compelled to bring it up because a Absolutely. lot of people are like, you're the farrier, why are you looking in my horse's mouth? But you know, this takes me back to um, Tony Gonzalez who I don't yeah. know if you ever got to meet him. I um, didn't, not, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I know of him, of course. I worked with him and it was way back when I, I returned from Australia in 88. Okay, that's starting to date me. I lived there for a year and when I landed back in LA, the first thing I did was rent a car, which had not driven a car on my, in the States for a year, but I drove down to his workshop and had already known about him beforehand. But he was a fairy that looked up and he really, we have to give him credit for getting people to start paying more attention to yeah. saddle fit. Yeah. And in the same way, looking at the incisors is a way for us to start looking at more than just the symptoms, but to start finding the causes. And we have to find those root causes if we're really gonna make a profound change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things, the tricks I like with horses that often can't um, stand up well or aren't very balanced is to paint a horizon line in my workspace. Mm. Because if they can balance with their eyes, you know, if their feet are giving them poor information, maybe their teeth are giving them poor information to their jaw and their TMJ and their atlas occiput, but, but I can give them something their eyes can focus on. A lot of times we'll take these horses outside and work on them outside because they can see the horizon and they can see where down is more effectively. They can interact with gravity more effectively and they actually get quieter. Oh yeah, that's so cool. Because in the Feldenkrais world, one of the things that's sort of a, a running theme is when you stand up after a lesson to notice your horizon, because it can change as much as six inches from the lesson you did on the ground. So we orient based on this horizon. And you know, I always talk about how you can turn your head sideways and the horizon is still level 
and where it's supposed to be. Whereas if you turn a video camera, everybody's trying to fix the video because they're going to throw up because it's all over. Our That's brain right. is so amazing at keeping that horizon level. And I never thought about that, that need for a horse, but it makes perfect sense. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. My, my farrier shop at home has a blue, uh, the walls are painted blue, like what's behind me. Notice my horizon line behind me. And, um, and then I painted a horizon line around the blue so that when they're in there and they feel kind of closed in, they can't see another horse, they still can orient well. It's like why gymnasiums and pools have stripes along the walls always. Wow. Right. So you can orient to down. Yeah. Very so, cool. cool stuff. Yeah. Cool stuff. So this is just some quick examples of how the posture changes in response to um, approaching the feet a certain way. And I'm going to get into a little bit about what I do with that. Um, this, this is a mare that I've worked on for 12 years, believe it or not. And this was her first visit. And when we do these posture pictures, we don't pose the horses. We just let them get bored and let them go to their place of rest. And we assess that as posture. So um, you can see in this case, we were in an aisleway. She's a little crooked in the aisleway. And I backed myself into the stall door so I could kind of get a direct shot laterally onto her. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to do, but um, you get the idea. Um, what's interesting about this horse is um, she didn't have long toes. She didn't have inordinately uh, low heels, but um, she was a client of Dr. Shoemaker's and, and she asked me to go out and see if I could help this mare with her feet stand up a little more square. She was not sound. She had a um, horrible um, bone spur on her navicular on the right front and she had injured her right hip somehow. You know, it was kind of out of whack somehow. And so just by, you know, trimming her toes back a little bit, we were able to get her to stand up three legs fairly perpendicular to the ground. Yeah. The, the right hip was still an issue. But what's interesting is we've applied this, these ideas to this horse now for 12 years. She's still sound. We got her back sound. She's still sound in work, gets ridden five days a week on trail with a huge navicular spur. And look at her now. Wow. How cool is that? Yeah, really cool. Although I'll, I'll have you note, she is in glue on shoes now where she was barefoot before. What we found was that her condition advanced to the point where we needed additional mechanics to, to bring that footprint back. And we'll talk about that some as this goes on um, to help her continue to stand square and not get too much leverage and torque on her, um, you know, uh, navicular area. Mm -hmm. She has a very, you know, you can see she's built very long. Yeah. And a lot of these horses, when they're built long like this, they also have long coffin bones. Mm. So, so when you have a long coffin bone, it's very hard to not create that toe lever. You can imagine, you can't really trim it back. So we'll talk more about that. And originally we were able to do that, but as her condition progressed over time, because it was degenerative, um, you know, we had to get more creative on how to help her, but she's, she's doing great. I still work on her. That's cool. Yeah. So this is another example of a horse that I first met and literally I wish I had taken a tape measure and measured the distance between his front and back feet. I swear it was like two feet. Wow. And he's in like a wash stall and I had to like get back. We were just talking and I look over, I'm like, oh dear, this is not good. So I get back and we took a picture of, um, you know, where, how he was standing. And all I did in this, this picture here was trim him. So I took his shoes off and I trimmed him and we got this much change expansion in his posture just from giving him less of a long toe, low heel kind of foot confirmation. And, um, but I knew that this was a horse that was going to need a lot of in intervention. So he did end up getting fancy dentistry um, and things like that. And so this is where he was six months later. Wow. Morgan? He's an Arab. Oh, he's an Arabian. Okay. Just yep. And, and what's interesting about this is it looks like he's posed, right? It looks, looks like somebody yeah. brought him up and pushed him back and pushed him forward. You can't back a horse into square stance. It, does, it, it gets their hind end under them too much. You have to walk them forward and see where they stop. Yep. Let them get bored. And literally the person walking this horse out, we had just put his shoes on. Notice he has shoes on. 
the, um, the person was walking out, stopped to answer a question I had just asked them. We were chatting for several minutes and I, I'm like, can you just hang out there one second? I'm gonna grab my, my, my at the time it was my camera because this is an older picture. But, um, you know, and I, and I got this shock. So I'm like, this is just where he went. We didn't pose him here. And I, that was so impressive to me that after only six months of giving him different input to his nervous system, by getting his teeth done differently, by you know um, doing his feet differently, and um, Dr. Shoemaker did work on him at the time um, because you have to figure out how to work them through those compensations, right? Yep. And our chiropractors and body workers are excellent teammates for us with that. Um, uh, this is where this is where he went, and he went back. To, he was not sound. He went back to performing and back to winning at, at the national level. Wow. So uh, just uh, a case in point, like I love how the front leg is so straight, but he looks like he's a little camped out behind. Mm -hmm. and is that, I mean, it's almost like he's gone a little bit too far the other way. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a problem. Okay. I per that doesn't bother me. Um, I've been taught that it's like, um, like your um, carriage horse might go to park or why Morgan's park, right? Is because it's very stable. Mm. Okay. Very stable. Um, the other situation you'll see, they'll get their hocks out behind their croup when they're a little bit sickle hocked. Okay. Because in order for their cannon bone, so I kind of look at the cannon bone predominantly, and yes, he does look like he's a little bit this way. Yeah, there's a but, little tiny bit of angle there. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so on him, I think it's actually that he is a little bit, a little perked out, but I, I don't think that's detrimental. Okay. Yeah, because you know, then there's the discussion. Do you drop the line from the from the ischial tuberosity from the point of the seat bone to the back of the leg, or are you looking through the cannon bone? Right. I'm literally looking. For me, I look through the middle of the cannon bone and making that perpendicular to the ground. Okay, got it. Because you know the horses are all put together a little differently. Correct. Yep. So I try not to be too picky about it. I literally just want vertical cannon bones. Right. That. Okay, I get it. But well, because I'm every a horse is built a little different, yeah. Exactly. Well, and that's the thing is that's why I'm asking because um, on your other picture I was like, oh, that hind leg looks a little further out than I might, you know, in the square stance that I might, right. might choose. And again here, but you know, this is where it's really nice with you is we can have that conversation and go, what is it that you're really looking for? And you're looking for vertical cannon bones. Perfect. Right. I get it. Right. And and look, if we're somewhere in this ballpark, we're helping the horse. Oh, absolutely. Right? And compared to where you started, there's no. It's a no brainer. Right. Yeah. I mean, hairs. look at this. Exactly. Compared to where you started, it's a no brainer. <laughs> and I, and I want you all to take a special notice of the confirmation of his hind feet here. Can you see, I know it's a funny angle, but can you see how bull nose the dorsal wall is and how yeah. steep the coronary band angle is? So he's got a, a quite low negative plantar P3 angle here in the first picture. Right. And when I trimmed him after, my goal was to stand him more upright, get more heel, less of a long lever arm of toe, right? But look at his hind feet here. Yeah. The goal is to have that coronary band pointing at the knee or below. If you draw a, a straight line through the coronary band, like a yardstick or a broom handle, you want it to go to the knee or below. And his, to me, in this, look like they go right at the knee or just below it. Can you just take your pointer and go from that coronary band forward? Not this way. Where's, how do I get a pointer when I'm sharing my screen in a presentation? Oh, well, just the same way you get your pointer when you're doing a presentation. <laughs> I, how do I do that? Just use your trackpad. Like I can move my arrow around, but uh, yeah. not in this presentation. I can't, but I can do it this way. Hold on. Oh, I can do it this way. Here we go. That's weird. So, that you lose your pointer. I know that is weird, but if you take this line here, if you all can see that, Yep. Right. Take that line there and go this way. To me, it looks like it's pointing right about there. Yeah. Or maybe a tiny bit lower than that. Watch this. Watch this. Hold on. We can, really, <laughs> we can be really slick about this because, you know, Keynote is amazing. So if I put this, let's see here, on his coronary band like that and drag it forward. Let's see. Does that look about, about right? Yeah. I, I would personally drop it a tiny bit because I think that yeah, okay, up a time. Yeah, maybe you're right. Just at the the knee. Yep. It's That's too bad. I'm, although I'm sure that we're going to come up with a way to do that for the front feet to figure out a, how we draw the line for the front feet. Well, the, the trick with the front feet is you have to look at hoof pasture and axis. 
So can uh, we, let's get to that. Should we get to that? Yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's okay. This is great. This is totally great. All right. Let me go back to the play. Oh, now I have a line. There you go. Yay. Okay. And so this is- People are asking questions, but I'm going to hold those questions till you get a little further along. Okay. So these are horses that just have trims. Like these are just horses that I trimmed. They're in Nigeria. The top one is a Sudanese horse. And the bottom one, of course, is one of our lovely um, burros, donkeys uh, that we have here. But th these guys were in, in Nigeria. And so just by trimming their feet a little differently, they can stand up better. So it doesn't have to be so complicated is the point. Right, it's and like, what's so lovely is to see how the, the neckline on the horse on the top, how has it let go? It's just relaxed. Right, and the donkey on the bottom, his feet, I don't, if, if you can see his front feet, they are so bad. Yeah, so bad, long, low heel, long toe. Okay, oh yeah, I have to kind of, and he looks club footed behind. Yes, but that's actually from, he, his fetlocks are low and he's actually bull nosed like this. Ooh. Okay. So he's like collapsing behind. So look at how his, his pastern angle has come up behind. Yeah. Even though he's not completely square and he's still bulging his neck. Well, he, he's a donkey, okay. He's a donkey, right. Yeah. Okay. And he's a so, long back donkey. <laughs> yes, and a long back donkey. So this is where um, I love, Wendy, what you and I do is so much fun because this is a horse I've worked on recently who was um, badly foundered. And he was beating up his hind end in the worst way and really not able to step through with those hind feet. Like he was just, he was just crab walking. And when you would turn him, he was so sore on the front, but he was so sore on the back. Mm -hmm. So we just stuck him on my um, physio pad, which mm -hmm. I love, especially because it's pink for me. Thank I you. I know you have the only pink one that I know of at this point. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We've talked about that. We need to get yeah, more. We have. Well, we we'll again. <laughs> more pee pads. Um, so he loved this because what he immediately did was he immediately parked out his front feet. And I wish I'd gotten that part on video, but look how chill he is. I mean, yes, he has his beamer blanket on, but he is loving stretching forward over his top line and he's loading, choosing to load his front feet, Yeah, which he hadn't been doing. He had been parking those hind feet way underneath himself and look how he's put his toes down into that pad. I mean, you yeah, know, that's what I was looking at. He's yeah. really driving and yeah. So what he's doing is he's functionally raising his heel angle yeah. and that allows him to bring his cannon bones back and relieve his hocks and hips and stifles and back. At least that's what I see from my perspective, Wendy, maybe you can share what, what you take. You, know, you, you know, what's so interesting is, um, uh, Dr. Deb Taylor has taken some x-rays of horses standing on physio pads on top of the x-ray block, right? Yeah. And, and there was one horse and um, Ida was there and this horse was a uh, quarter horse, super club footed behind. And this is exactly what he did. He drove his toes down into that pad and even deformed it all the way into the, just about to the block. Yep. Um, but after they saw what he preferred, then they employed that in their trim and in their form of hoof. And this horse walked off so much happier. So, yeah. you know, this can give you a lot of insight. We're actually, Daisy, um, in, uh, in uh, we're making an x-ray block with a physio pad on top of it. Ooh, that's cool. Because, um, yeah, to be sold. Um, and we're waiting for, we're waiting, we have to, we have to bang on some heads, but because um, we ordered it a while ago and it hasn't come yet, but we've been, we've been making some prototypes and we've just been cutting up physio pads and gluing oh, that'd them. That'd be cool. Box. And um, I can't and, wait to get that. Yeah, and it's been really fascinating because one of the things you can see when you do that is like um, uh, Dr. Riley x-rayed a horse on, uh, radiographed a horse on just the block themselves. And then he put the ones with the physio pad and what you couldn't see on the flat blocks was the load. And as soon as they took it, you could see how the right foot was not really loaded, that the horse was actually putting the weight because there's no way to measure how much pressure is on that block, right? right. The, the foot can appear flat. It, it is flat, but is it loaded? And right. with the physio pad, you can see whether or not this horse is truly loading. And it's fascinating. I could, I could totally see some really cool studies done with that. Yeah. So yeah, we're, um, Brad's overhearing me in the other room. He's in charge of prototypes. Okay, Brad, <laughs> chop to it. <laughs> and maybe we can right, get so. some, some of those pink physio pads. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. So then this is what was cool was look how this horse walks off. So this is, this horse, he could not engage that hind end. 
and you saw him stutter at the beginning. We'll go back to the beginning. Yeah. But what I wanted to show you all is I'm asking him to do some pretty hard turns for a laminated course because I'm now he stops to say hi to his friend. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but normally to engage gait, this horse would have literally gone backwards to go forwards. And when wow. he stepped off the physio pad, he wanted to go backwards again and then figured out he could do it the other way. So watch this again. Seems hesitate. Yeah, he did. He was like, he's like, oh, okay, well, for me to go forward, I, I have to engage my gait very awkwardly here. And then he went, oh, oh no, oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah. And then look how he's marching through behind. He would yeah. never have stepped. I wish I had taken video before. Yeah, you know, we always think that. We always go like, oh, darn. <laughs> no, I know. But this horse was not crossing over his feet in front, and he was not stepping through behind. And it's a tight aisleway, and he yeah, did an excellent aisle. job. So you know, I love using all these different modalities to complement each other to help the horse overcome their wear and tear of life. This horse is in his mid thirties. Wow. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Very cool. And you know, Beamer and Surefoot are really complementary. There's a lot of people in Europe combining those two. I think more and more people here too. Um, you know, we use it all the time together and find that it's really powerful. For sure. So, so where does this all come down to with the hoof, right? Um, when it comes to what we do with the foot in particular, I look at the foot from balancing around the center of rotation, which is basically the center of that joint. So the coffin joint. So this, um, this diagram is meant to give you the idea that, that the coffin joint itself is according to Hillary Clayton, is largely responsible for accommodating irregularities in terrain and irregularities in farriery, but it cannot do it well day after day, step after step. Right? That's what she. That's what she's shared with us at some of the presentations I've seen with her. Um, and so I look at balance from all these different directions because a lot of us are taught to look at hook balance from the bottom of the foot, and it's not enough. It's not enough. If you think about a table leg coming down with a swivel base, you know those old school chairs we used to sit on, not yeah. aging myself, right? If you put one of those chairs on unlevel ground, those swivel feet will just accommodate, even if they're cocked sideways, in order to get that chair as stable and level as it can be. So everything we do with the horse's foot, trimming, shoeing, anything, is going to put strain and torque and wear and tear on the coffin joint and also compensation up the horse's body and the whole system, right? So like we've talked about how many different ways the horses get input with balance and how it stands and how it uses its body. So for me, from the foot perspective, I don't think about balance from the, the sole side looking down on the horse's foot. I think of it as the horse stands on its feet. Mm -hmm. from the top, top down. That's a little different. So just looking at the, the foot in general, just so you have an idea of where that center of rotation is, it's located in um, the, the bottom end of the short pattern. That's the rotational center of the entire hoof capsule. So if, you know, depending on who you talk to, 80 to 90% of lameness issues are in the foot, and what we're finding now with MRI is that a lot of our caudal heel pain horses are actually having problems with uh, soft tissue like ligaments and tendons, especially balanced this way, you know, mm -hmm. from side to side. That's all affecting that joint, right? Right. I'll have my model in here. I would use that. That would have been smart. So, you know, looking at the soft tissue in the back of the foot and then the bone and the horn in the front of the foot, the center is is what everything rotates around. And we look at the sole side of the foot, we can, we can orient ourselves to the center. And this gets back into, Wendy, what you mentioned about looking at the pattern in the jaw mm -hmm. and it is repetitive in the whole body. And I see that in one foot, you have a pattern, you'll have it in all four feet. And mm -hmm. I've been told you'll see it in the pelvis, you'll see it in the um, skull, right? in the shoulders and withers, whatever torque is going on, you're going to see repetitive patterns of that. And that's one of the reasons why we can map feet. 
and we can look at feet and we can say a coffin bone is the shape of a coffin bone, you know, whether it's super big or super small, they all have about the same shape. And we've talked about this in one of our other presentations, Wendy. Yep. Right? Coffin bones have similar shape and proportion. So we can find that center very easily. And that's that pink circle in the middle. That's the center. And reliably, if you map the outside of the foot and then you take radiographs, it's absolutely reliable. This was a dissection we did with Paige Koss, where oh, I mapped the foot. <laughs> Paige is great, right? Yeah. I mapped the foot and then she did this dissection. And um, I would tell her exactly where the bone was. I would say exactly where the center is. I would say, you know, this is where everything is inside this foot. And we dissect it and I'd be spot on every time. Awesome. And that's well, something that anybody can do. Page, and so if anybody wants to see some of the, these, the images she has, they are stunning. Aren't they great? They're, yeah, they're, they're amazing. And she's really- She does cool. beautiful stuff. Yeah. Yep. These are just casual pictures from our clinics. We used to do a clinic with her. Every time I had a hoof clinic, she, when she was in Virginia, she'd come up and do dissection for us. But now that she's in Arizona, that's a little more tricky. A little hard. Yeah. So the idea here is that, you know, you can put the coffin bone right there in the middle and you should be able to see it there. You know, if you're looking at feet and studying feet, it's not hard to figure out how to train your eye to see these things, right? And so the foot, the way I look at the foot is that there are four arches. So the bone sits on the sole body. This comes from Mike Savoldi, who's a retired farrier in California. And I learned this from him years and years ago. And so if you look at the sole body on the bottom, that's what the bone stands on. And that's what we trim, right? That's what we affect in our trim work. Yep. Then there's corium and the digital cushion. And then on top of that sits the bone. And he talks about around that center of rotation, there's a toe arch, a heel arch, a medial arch, and a lateral arch. So if you're thinking about long toe, low heel being prevalent in horses and creating this posture problem, this, this base narrow posture, go down a rock, then what's happening is the heel arch is being crushed. And then the toe arch is, is running away. Yep. Okay. So when I think about it that way, it makes it easier for me to understand what I need to do to help this horse in order to get the posture improved. Right. Thinking about which arch, which arch is collapsing based on load. And Wendy, what you said about how the horse loads its limb, it needs to have a stable, you know, solid, thing to stand on this thousand pounds on average, right? So if well, you don't have- And it's really interesting to think about these as arches because our foot has three arches. Mm. Our three. foot has the, the one we think of, right? When yeah. people wear uh, orthotics and that sort of thing. But um, you have the arch underneath the toes. Okay. Right? And you yeah. have the two arches of the foot. Uh, I, man, it's a little escaping me, but- um, Lateral. I believe knee. you. Yeah, this way and this way, right? Right. But there's yeah. three arches in the foot, in the foot, in the human. Yes. So, and of course, the anatomy is a little different, right? Absolutely. Right, because you know our heel is the horse's hock, you know, so on and so forth. But the so, concept, the concept of having arches, because an arch is a very strong structure. That's right. that's the point. That's is what you're thinking. Arch about. Yes. I mean, in Pennsylvania, of course, the keystone in the arch of the windows was the architecture that yeah. you see all over Pennsylvania. And the keystone is, here is the COR. Right. right. Correct. Exactly. Yes. I like that. Thank you for tying it into my home state. That's wonderful. Please, because, Nicely done. You know, but you can see that right there in that image. And, and uh, yeah, you are the keystone state. Yes. <laughs> So this, these are just two additional nice ways to look at this. These are also images from Mike Savoldi. He does beautiful dissections as well. Um, you can see here that if, if the bone is sitting just on what he calls the sole body, right? Again, what we trim, then there would be corium between the bone and that sole, and there'd be digital cushion in the back. But the idea is that the COR would be there, and in the middle, you'd have the toe arch in the front and the heel arch in the back. And then with the bone removed, you can really see the architecture of that sole truly has an arch to it. Yeah. And then the same thing for medial and lateral. So the COR is there, and then you have the bone sitting on top of the sole body, and there would be corium filling that empty space. But you can see the medial arch and the lateral arch 
are still there. So when you have a horse that say, um, lands hard on the outside, if you've ever seen a horse walk and they land really hard on the outside and then flop over, that's because they're, they're, it's usually the lateral side, the lateral arch is too high. So as their leg swings and their foot is a pendulum at the end of that leg, right? And when it lands, whatever lands first is too long. It's in their way. And so all sorts of crazy things can happen. But just thinking about it from the perspective of medial lateral arches, that gets even more complicated, which is fun, yeah. right? <laughs> And then of course, what makes up our heel arch is that the health of that digital cushion. So that's why you know, we'll hear Dr. Bowker and I'm sure many of these other you know, hoof people, um, you know, I'm sure Ida would have talked about it and Deb, Deb Taylor would have talked about it. The health of the back of the foot is so important um, and it's filled with that digital cushion. And when that digital cushion is not healthy and the frog is not healthy, then we lose our heel arch. Yep. Okay. So, I've basically put together my hoof guidelines, which is what I teach on and what I approach every horse with. And they're guidelines because obviously there's time and place to go outside of guidelines, but these are the things that I look at predominantly. And when I show you these guidelines, realize that they've been reverse engineered. So I didn't come into this and say, every foot should look like this and every horse should be this way. What I did is I looked at my database of over 500,000 images of hoof feet over the last um, 16 years I've been tracking feet this way and then with my radiograph machine being able to also take corresponding uh, radiographs so over time so before trim after trim after adding a shoe and a lot of horses I have followed for over 10 years and so I've discovered and this is not this is not things other people don't look at other people look at these things too this is just the way that I conceptualize it but there's repeating patterns over and over and over again correlating postural problems with external hoof appearance and the internal anatomy that goes with that and then associated pathology. So how do we get horses to have healthy feet and stand square, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and then I've extrapolated these hoof guidelines. So you can see on these pictures here at the bottom, this is a before and after series of a horse that I worked on um, over a five month period of time, five months, 11, 12, one, two, three months, three months at any rate wasn't very long and he had a shoe on in the beginning and his foot looked like the x-ray on the left and then we did a repeat x-ray um, there the second radiograph um, that's comparing those two feet over time and then i have the picture the hoof pictures to go with them that correspond and you can see the difference in the capsule shape the difference in the Look at the cannon bone. The bit of cannon bone you can see in the after picture is more vertical than the one before. Even though we try to do our documentation with square cannon bones, it doesn't always work because sometimes the horses just can't do it. Right. Um, and then looking at the heel angle change. So these are all, this is the amount of detail that we put into all these photographs. So the hoof guidelines I've put together look like this. So my goal is a 50-50 ratio, so 50% toe to 50% heel around that center. If you're looking at the foot from the side, right? I'm looking at a, a bottom angle of the bone that's between five and eight degrees with a straight hoof passion axis. I'm looking at minimal distortion in that capsule. So minimal flares, right? I want alignment of the capsule to the bone, to the internal structure. I want appropriate vertical depth. So sometimes horses are thin soled and sometimes horses are too tall and neither is ideal. And then I want to look at medial lateral balance, looking at a whole bunch of complicated stuff. Cool. All right. The, um, we have some questions. So let me oh. see if I can uh, run through some of these questions. Sure. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to go back a bit. Um, so somebody was saying, if a horse resting under the under the barn seems to stand square. I think there's a typo there. If a horse resting under the barn seems to stand square in front, but regularly switches its weight behind to rest one foot and then the other in a fairly regular pattern, do you think the horse is balanced or unbalanced? That's, that's a horse that's compensating. Right, I would say there's some discomfort there and that's why, so it's like us when we're standing and we switch from foot to foot. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, someone said, observed a change in my horse when riding. As I improve her hoof balance, she is less likely to jackhammer at the lope. Smoother ride, more balanced, and with softer mouth. Incredible difference. Yes. Um, Jessica typed something that I absolutely can't read. Um, it looks like Finnish, maybe. <laughs> um, oh, okay. My horse rests a hind leg with his horse rests his hind end uphill in pasture like almost a foot higher. Oh, in other words, he's standing in the pasture with his hind end uphill. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. That's exactly what I thought. That's my Al tends to put his front feet low. He's kind of dug out a little corner in the shed, which we've made it so they don't stand in the shed so much anymore, but he would put his front end low. This is interesting to hear a horse putting his, his uh, back end up on a hill. Uh, I'm not sure I have, I don't have, I don't have an answer. Do you have an answer? I would I would get some short foot pads and a beamer and check your hoof balance and check your dentistry and call a chiropractor. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay, I mean, you know, you've got to start you've got to start figuring out why, why? is this doing, it's still abnormal even though it's not typical abnormal it's still abnormal and why is the horse doing that? Right, that's what I'd be thinking about. Yep, is your trimming based on altering posture or do you take cues from the foot and is it just so happens that posture improves? In other words, how much does the in initial posture determine your trim, if at all? That's a really good question. The, yeah. answer to that, the answer to that is if the horse is barefoot, if the horse is barefoot, sometimes we can't achieve quite a 50-50. And thank you very much for transitioning well to my last little bit of my presentation here, which is, um, you know, trimming is a subtractive process only. You're not adding anything back. So if you don't have heel to work with and the toe is long and the horse is thin sold and the horse stands incredibly good on a rock, then I'm going to try to push that trim, have a conversation with the owner about maybe adding a glue on shoe or looking at dentistry or where else can we try to help him stand better. But at the end of the day, you're limited by the health of the structure that you have. If on the other hand, I have a foot that's just incredibly overgrown, has a tall heel, long toe, then I'm going to aim for my hoof guidelines. And if I achieve them and then the horse doesn't stand square, I'm gonna, again, bring up dentistry, body work, short foot pads, something to help this horse overcome his compensatory pattern. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go for these guidelines and observe the postural change is the answer to your question. And if I can get to my guidelines and I don't have enough postural change, then I'm gonna start looking at other ways we can help the horse. If on the other hand, I can't get to my guidelines and the horse isn't standing square, I'm going to think about what else I can do as well as those other things. If I can't get to my guidelines and the horse stands square anyway, I might say, we're, we're okay for now. Like, let's just see how this goes. I'm not happy with the feet, but they just have to work for him. They don't have to work for me, right? Like I, there's mm -hmm. no part of these hoof guidelines say the, sole must be X amount thick and the frog must be exactly this wide because I don't have the luxury of that. I work on a lot of very pathologic feet. So my goal is that the horse can have a stable interaction with gravity without overdue compensation over time. So if he stands square and the feet aren't ideal, so right. be it. Good, good answer. Um, and this will also, somebody saying, what are the boots that were on the back of the foundered horse? I did not, he didn't, oh, the, the Beamer boots, the leg boots. Ah, okay, Beamer boots, okay. Yeah, That's those are good. those are Beamer leg cuffs. Yeah, I was gonna say they weren't boots, but um, okay, when you see a horse land on the outside lateral side of hoof first at walk, what parameters do you check in the trim? Is the goal that the trim will allow the foot to land flat? Ooh, okay, read that one more time. That's a good question, read it one more time. When you see a horse land on the outside lateral side of the hoof first at walk, what parameters do you check in the trim? Is the goal that the trim will allow the foot to land flat? Yes. So the parameters that I check is I always look for three reasons to make a balance change. I'm imposing a balance change off sole plane. You need to do that carefully. So I want three reasons that I look at that horse and say, yes, I need to tip my trim, say, take extra off the lateral and leave more on the medial. And I have a lot of case studies like this in my Patreon blog because it's, it's something that a lot of us don't know what to do with. We're not really trained to what to do with medial lateral imbalances this way. 
And, and this to me, this is not really medial lateral balance, right? This is medial lateral balance. But in Ferrari, for whatever reason, we call medial lateral balance on the distal to proximal plane medial lateral, but it's not. What would you call it? Roll. Ah, okay. So this is roll. If you think about it from the top down, the foot is rolling to the outside or the inside. The horse that lands hard on the outside, they roll medially. Yes, that's okay? right. So when we think about it as medial lateral balance, we're thinking about it this way, but really medial lateral balance should be this way. The footprint is to the inside or to the outside, not this way. This is yeah. not medial lateral balance. It, yeah, it's another one of those places where we, it's like bend, bend, you know, when we talk about longitudinal versus lateral bend as opposed to extension flexion. Yeah. Right. Another one right. of those. Uh, we lose the, um, the uh, objective terms to a more subjective perspective. Right. Um, so can I show you the last little bit of this? Are we pushing our time? Uh, wait, wait, oh. you, no, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Some sure. other questions. Okay, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, somebody emailed me a question earlier. I'm just doing Q and A before we get to the next. Can you unshare your screen, then I can get to my. Um, yes, I can. Because there that. were a lot of questions that I held them off. Um, so okay. somebody sent me a question. Let me just get over to that because then we can. Oh right, I uh, I turned my mail off. But while my mail is starting up again, um, any thoughts on Palmer angle being measured on a hard barn floor as opposed to the somewhat giving ground so many of them live on work on? Yeah, so that's a good question. So to me, um, I always assess my horse statically, meaning standing on a level surface, because of course the foot has to accommodate variations in terrain, but it's going to accommodate a variations in terrain based on whether it's going up the hill, down the hill, sideways, turning. So if we assess the horse at rest in neutral stance on a level ground, we can create a baseline to follow and we can create something we can measure where it's really hard to be objective and measurable on something that is like, oh, this is their favorite place to stand. Now, like the short foot pad on top of the x-ray block, there's absolutely value in seeing where does the horse choose to go given all things are equal. But again, that's not putting them on a downhill slant and just going, we're gonna assess it this way. You have to have some objective baseline, just like the horizon. We all uh, operate off a horizon. You've gotta choose something as your baseline so that you can, uh, because otherwise there's, it's just, it's, you don't know whether you're up, down, left, right. Okay, um, question, how does Daisy approach a sheared heel Hairline is pushed up along the medial side of the hoof wall, but when you lower the medial side to the balance to balance the sole, the hoof leans in. Limb looks leaned medially. Outside heel makes ground contact first, unless inside heel is over ground. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's the worst thing on the planet. Why we're taught to lower that medial heel? I think it comes from traditional farriery. Because what, what they're trying to do is put a metal shoe on there and float the medial side. So we're taught to trim the medial side shorter so it drops down. But in reality, the back of the foot, the soft tissue in the back of the foot is so deformable that when you have a sheared heel, it does not relate to the balance of the joint. It does not. Because that, that soft tissue in the back can move independently of the coffin joint itself. So you know, um, Dennis Varden did a, did a couple of webinars with me and he had some video of, of the back of the foot where it was by hand movable. It was, he was talking about media yes. labs. Anyway. And I, and I have, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have a great case study where I took a horse that had a medial sheared heel where the whole heel bulb, coronary band, everything was displaced proximally by, by probably an inch. <gasps> It was awful and the, the medial wall didn't even touch the ground. They had been wedging the medial side of this horse's foot independently. So not sharing load across the entire back, just wedging the medial heel with eight degrees. And the whole back of the foot moved. And this horse landed hard on the outside, just like you're saying, and the whole foot was just twisted like mad. So what I did is I actually trimmed the lateral side way lower 
I ignore the wall length on the medial side. I cover up the coronary band with my rasp and look down, sight down the foot, and it'll show you the plane of the foot, not the plane of the displaced hairline. And the length of the heels in the back of the foot is not something I look at for medial lateral balance. It doesn't hold true on radiograph. So again, thinking about those three criteria, equal heel length is not one that I look at. And I talk about a lot of this in my teaching material, which things I find important and which things I don't. So if you're interested in more of that, there's tons of that in um, some of the, the Patreon blog and my online trimming course. Yep. Okay. Moving on. Um, yes. uh, let's see. How do you feel the difference between compensating behind and resting behind? Or how do you tell? I think it's how do you tell the difference between compensating and resting? Well, I think, Wendy, you sort of answered that question when you talked about when we stand, if we shift our weight a lot, it's because we're uncomfortable, right? And so for us, the most neutral way to stand would be to stand with two feet level in a relaxed posture. And so if a horse is resting one hind leg, to me, that's telling me it's compensating for something. Well, and I think we also have to look at the fact that sometimes horses do rest a hind leg and they're not compensating. But I think what you have to look at is duration. Like yeah. if a horse is switching, 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 he's clearly uncomfortable and probably bilaterally uncomfortable. Whereas mm -hmm. if he's always resting the same hind leg, then you have to think, wow, why isn't he standing square? So I think you have to look at the circumstances before you, right. could, you know, it depends. <laughs> it depends yeah, right what the overall picture is. And then again, it depends on what their base is. Are they base narrow? Are they parking? Are they plant, you know, what is the rest of, what are they comp doing with the rest of the legs in relation right. to that one? Um, yes, agree. And I, and I think it goes with everything, right? Like yeah. you wanna look for multiple validating factors. So when the horse, you know, is under saddle, do they, you know, pick up each lead symmetrically? Do they, do they, you know, tilt their head when they're trotting on a straight line? So you're looking for other things that are asymmetrical to tell you whether there's really a problem or not. Yep. Okay. I have one question for me, okay. and this may sound really, really basic, but how do you determine sole depth? Oh, that's a, that's one of my favorite questions. Oh, good. Because, you know, I keep hearing about sole depth and I keep looking at my horse's feet and I'm like, okay, how do you measure this? <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of ideas out there about how to do that. And um, what I can tell you is that to me, sole depth is not as important as sole quality, right? Okay. So you can, to some degree, look at the depth of the collateral grooves, but only as an, an, as an estimation of amount of sole, not as an estimation of quality of sole. And, it, and for me, it doesn't work for medial lateral balance. Um, and that's because the bone models away. So you can have even sole depth and your joint spacing might be really off. Okay. So... The, the, I've seen thin soles that are super, super, super hard and strong. And thin sole would be very little depth around the frog apex, right? Mm -hmm. Where a thicker sole is gonna have more depth around the frog apex, but I've seen those soles that, are, that appear to be quite thick and then um, the horse is really foot sore. So ideal is considered on a radiograph is considered um, 15 millimeters of sole from the bone to the end of the visible sole that accounts for five millimeters of corium. So blood and nerves. So a centimeter of sole is what the goal is. I don't think there's very few horses in a wet environment that actually end up with a centimeter of true sole. Uh, so to me, it's more a matter of, is, it, is the sole pliable? Can I push it with my fingers and it moves? Um, is, it, <clears throat> is, it, um, is the horse sound on rocks? Because I don't really care if the horse has a really thick sole, but if they're not sound on rocks, it's not doing them much good. Right. Okay, that really answers my question because, you know, it, um, you know, like I said, you hear about soul depth, but, but it's just like, is it pretty or is it functional? Right. Um, we're always looking, I'm always looking for functional. Me too. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you. That makes me feel more at ease. Okay, onward. <laughs> okay, is it my turn again? Yeah. Okay, good. Good, good, good. All right. Let me see, where is my doo -doo -doo? That's interesting. I don't know why it does that. Let's see. <laughs> oh, we're zoomed in for some reason. Okay, so we were talking about hoof guidelines, and now we're going to the trim. So um, the, we have to keep in mind that that trim is a subtractive process only. So no matter what our goals are, 
sometimes we can get there in the trim and sometimes we need to add something back, which is where I talk about a prosthetic device. And to me, a prosthetic device is a boot, a composite shoe, a metal shoe, anything that we're adding to create additional balance, support, protection, structure, mechanics, what have you. There's a lot of reasons we might add something. This is just a quick um, series on a horse that had quite a deformed foot and um, you can imagine was not sound on the left. And it turned out that he had a fused coffin joint. Oh, wow. So, right. So while the farrier was doing a good job at leaving room for his bone because his bone was pointing straight down, um, it was a lot of leverage on the joint so the horse was not sound. So the way that I solved the problem is I went to my hoof guidelines. So this was a horse that taught me a lot because I went to my hoof guidelines, right? 50-50 basis support, positive palmar angle. I couldn't impact that much because obviously the joint was fused this way. Um, I wanted to have, um, um, you know, minimal distortions. That bulge in his coronary band is not from a flare that is actually the foot made room for the ring bone around his joint, the arthritis around his joint. So he actually, his bone is parallel in there, believe it or not. And, um, and then I created a device that I could put on his foot to add the vertical depth back in and create the breakover further back so that he basically rolled over it like a peg leg. Mm. So it worked really well for him. But this is an extreme example where applying those, those hoof guidelines on an ugly foot created something that was functional and allowed the horse to move around, be sound, interact with gravity, and he stood square. Wow. Okay. So here's another example. This is a horse that I worked on. Um, the the before picture before I started working on her and then after I'd been working on her for a period of time um, just the posture change the the muscular change this horse's job didn't change her you know her owner didn't change nothing else changed except I decided to shoe and trim her completely differently and this is one of those situations where I could not achieve my goals in just the trim um, this is what her foot looked like at the first visit it's not a horrible foot. I mean, it has, has some hoof rings. It has some wall breakage. She did have um, some CD toe and ended up actually having a keratoma in her toe. Mm. And her whole case study is in that Patreon blog, if anybody wants to see it, um, where it goes into great detail about why she had this big hole cut out of her toe and all those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> but it's not, it's not a low heel. It's not an incredibly run forward toe. But she was not sound this way. She stood terribly. She had minimal top line and she had the worst arthritis in her hocks and her rear pasterns um, and um, her stifles. She was a hunter jumper mare and, um, and her feet on the back were like low fetlocks and bull nose. So if you look at that here, if you look at her hind feet in particular, see how she's got white on the front of her hind feet? Mm -hmm. She's dragging those hind toes so badly because her hind end is so sore. Mm. And when you look at the sum of those legs, we only have one leg standing, standing square. That right hind is the only one that's back. And here she's posing for a picture. So this is where she stopped and she's going to rest. In, in the photo on the right where she's standing square, this was literally, the owner was holding her and we were packing up our gear, setting up our gear that day, what have you. And I turned and looked at her and went, ah, oh, I want to take a picture of that. That's pretty cool. Does she stand like that a lot? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So this was her foot in the beginning. And then this is what I did with the shoe. So what it's important to appreciate here is the subtle changes in, in the alignment of this leg. And I'm going to show it to you in more detail, but I just want you to look at the, the subtle changes first, see what we observe here, and then I'll show you a diagrammatic way of looking at it. So this is the before. Wendy, what do you see? Well, the thing, it, not so much the picture on the left, but the picture on the right, the, the cannon bone and pastern are, through the fetlock are not aligned. Like, really not aligned. Oh. No. So this looks like a ton of stress on those joints. Yes. Yes. And there's this bulge on the, um, just above the uh, band. Yes. Like, yeah, she had some side bone. Yeah. Yep. She had some side bones. So that's another reason why looking at the coronary band being level 
doesn't necessarily indicate the level of the joint because if you have side bone or some or, or an unbalanced situation, it can make things wonky and it's not necessarily linear. So coronary band is one criteria I'll look at, but I'll still look for at least two more before I make a balance assessment change. And if it's really tricky like this mare, I'm gonna ask for a radiograph because I don't, I don't wanna impose something that's gonna screw her up. It's too important to guess when we have access to this fabulous technology, right? Right. So on the, the left picture, everything is run forward. Like even though she has a tall heel, it's got a lot of slope to it. And her toe runs forward and she's pinching at the coronary band, if you can see that. What do you mean by pinching? Well, let's see, let me back out of it this way. So you can, you can see my mouse right here. Yep. It's like pointy. Oh, okay, okay. Right, it's like, it's like pinched. So it's, it's this alignment, you know, if we look at the middle of the, the fetlock and come down this way, whenever you assess hoof pasture axis, don't ever let anyone tell you, you look at the front of the leg and the front of the foot. If, if you're looking at hoof pasture axis, which is the alignment of the hoof to the pastern, you want it to be straight, ideally. But if you look at the front, you know, these bones are trapezoids. They're not squares or rectangles. So the front surfaces are not parallel to each other. Right. So you need to look from center of joint to center of joint to center of joint. And when you look at hers here, she's actually broken back. Yeah. Okay. So even though her foot doesn't look terrible, what we're looking at is that the footprint here is way forward of the center of weight bearing of her cannon bone. Yes. Okay, so it's functionally acting like a long toe, even though it's not a bad foot in and of itself. Right. And then this adds a whole nother complication where she like- yeah, that was the thing that just jumped out at me like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was ridiculous. So when you look at it after, notice that now we have don't have the pinching here. Mm -hmm. Okay, notice that I've got the break over in the shoe all the way back to here. Yep. And I've got much, much more heel support than in this picture. Look where that heel was. Yep. It was, even though it's a tall heel, it's still underrun. And in this one, I'm able to glue that shoe on, extend the heel support a little bit. And now look where that center comes down, right? It's, there's more footprint back. Yep. And if you look at the center to the center to the center, we've got a pretty straight alignment. Yep. And then even this one, it's still wonky, yep. but it's the, the capsule itself is more under the center of mass than it was here. Well, and it's really interesting because in this picture on the right, the coronary vent looks fairly level, but in the next picture, you start to realize it's deceptive because right. here it doesn't look as level, but the alignment looks so much better. Right, which is why coronary band being level is, is a minimal criteria for me. Okay. Okay. Why do you have a big patch of pink stuff? This is the dental impression material, and that's because she would get a hoof cast over this, and this is to protect her heel bulbs and make sure that the casting as she grows doesn't get too tight and contract her heels. Oh, okay. So this is actually part of prosthetically building up the caudal part of her foot, which was very weak. So to make this truly complicated, can okay. you all see that? Okay. <laughs> So I've drawn this so that hopefully it'll help you visualize it. I put the radiograph over the picture and then drawn where the rotational centers of the joints are. Can you make it big? Yes. There, thanks. Okay. So the first picture you can see that the yellow lines have, are not straight and we call that broken back. It's which direction is the joint going. So. If the joint, if the lines go this way, it's considered broken back because the, the joint is going backwards. If it's, if it's a club foot or a foundered foot this way, right this way, then it's considered broken forward because the joint is going forward. So broken back, broken forward. So hoof passion axis will actually tell you a lot about the internal alignment of the coffin bone. So you can observe that externally fairly easily. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, she's quite broken back and you can see I've marked where the center is and where the back of her cannon bone is, the back of her heel bulb, the heel placement, the center, and then the toe. So going from the back of that picture towards the front, 
those white lines at the bottom are telling you how far apart that weight bearing surface is in front of the limb. Right. And you can see she has 30% heel and 70% toe. And our, my goal is 50 50. Right. right. So, what's cool about this is to show the after, after trim, right? So, this is just with the trim. I was able to get her to this point, which is still 70 30. Because I can't lower that heel too much because she's already broken back. And I can only back up the toe so much because it's not obscenely long. So this is a bit of a conformational problem and a bit of a posture problem. But yet when I glue on the shoe, I can manipulate where that ground surface is because I can't trim it this way. I can manipulate that and actually create the appropriate base of support. And look how much closer those three lines at the back get to each other. Yeah. So the weight bearing surface is further back under her center of mass. And that's why they stand square because I'm closer to my hoof guidelines and she's more, you know, she's not quite, you know, completely straight yet, but her hoof pastern axis is improved. So, so, you know, we always have this question of posture versus confirmation. And in this horse's case, there is a confirmational issue that is contributing to the posture. Right. And, it, and, and so, you know, like there's no perfect world. Okay. Right. Um, and we want to make the horse as comfortable as possible in the job that we're performing. Um, and in this case, it's really that you, you can't create something that isn't there. You need help. Yes. And that's when you might consider adding, uh, prosthesis. Now, boots are tricky because boots always move the footprint forward. Right. So, that was the thing that I hadn't thought about because I've never used boots, but how it makes the toe long and then you're right back to a long toe, low heel situation. And OMG, that was like such a stunner when I, Dennis talked about that when I was yes. like, because I haven't used boots, so I'd never thought about it, right? Yes. Um, so a lot of people say, well, can I just put my horse in boots? And I'm like, well, you're going to make your problem worse in this kind of situation. You know, that's not going to help you biomechanically. So yes, you're providing protection, but none of the mechanics that you need are there. In fact, you're going to kind of make them worse because the longer you make the foot, you put a boot over top of everything, you're making it bigger and more forward. Right. Right. So this I thought was a cool way to, to think about it. Um, you know, um, Martha Olivo was famous for talking about cone the cone and dome the dome way back when we were learning about, you know, this new thing called barefoot trimming. Oh, I had never heard that expression. <laughs> yeah, cone the cone and dome the dome was what she would talk about. And so, you know, she would talk about that there's a cone. If you put the point of the cone in the fetlock and you think about that cone as coming down being the hoof, that look at how the angle of the cone changes. The orientation of that whole cone moves back. Yeah. So that's what my goal is in my head. What I'm looking at is how do these things stack on top of each other? How do we give this horse a stable base of support and get the horse to get vertical cannon bones? And those hoof guidelines are what I have figured out over the last 16 years is what I need in order to help the horse achieve that last picture. And if I can't do it in my trim, I'm going to add a prosthetic device to help the horse get there. And then as you know, Wendy, all sorts of magic starts happening because the horse feels better and we can work on getting better input to their nervous system through the short foot pads, because that's a phenomenal tool, especially combined with these ideas, um, as well as our body workers and our chiropractors and our dentists. Right, and because you have to change the habits. You know, once you form a habit like that, it's so, so habitual, unconscious pattern. Um, sometimes you, there needs to be something that wakes up the nervous system that, that says, hey, it's different. Right. You know, feel this difference. And really that's what Surefoot's job is, is to input that information to say, hey, come on, there's another idea here. You can rebalance in a different way or return to a balance that you had if you just, you know, stand on this stuff and you realize, whoa, I got to figure this out. Right. And the beauty right. is he does it for himself. But, you know, I'm, it's okay. So now we've got the cone. I want to know what the dome is. The dome was like what you did with the flares and the hoof capsule. Oh, okay. Okay. The dome was like thinking about the foot as a, as a dome. And so, you know, I got it. Okay, I got it. So uh, sort of like the arches, actually, if you think about a little, it. A little bit, yeah, a little yeah. bit. It was, it was kind of a beginning idea of that point. Although, I, if I remember correctly, I think she did a lot of trimming from the top. And 
I don't, I don't really, I mean, I take flare from the top, but I put my balance in on the bottom and my sole is often trimmed asymmetrically because of all these crazy things, but it's probably the crooked population of horses I work on, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. But, you know, so to me, the way that I would use short foot pads with, with this concept is my guidelines are still my guidelines. My goals are still my goals because this is my starting point. And then what Surefoot helps me do is figure out what, how to, how to be creative for the horse to help the horse beyond that. Right? So like, I'm going to still go for my guidelines, but when the horse stands on the pad and I see, oh, maybe they're loading the outside even more, that might be a reason for me to suggest a radiograph or a shoe or push my trim a little further. Yeah, and see, I'm always looking at it from the other perspective. I look at these horses standing on sure foot pads and I try not to look at their feet and their trim, but, but what the pads are doing is leveling out. They're allowing them to level out into where they want to be. Right. In spite of the shoe or the trim. And that's, you know, so, you know, there's, the beauty is there's so many different ways to look at this. We're right. all heading in the same direction, but it's just the flip side of it. I can't do anything about their feet, but I can right. make the horse more comfortable offering them sure foot pads. And the number of horses without changing their feet, and the one I remember the most is Oreo down in Costa Rica. Uh, his, I mean, if I showed you his feet, you'd probably just curl up, but, um, but his whole attitude changed. Right. He couldn't change his feet because the farrier came tight in the clinches and left. And this horse was, he was so long. I mean, he could have been an elf. And, um, but his whole attitude changed. And he worked with us after that, whereas before that he was grumpy and he didn't want to work with us. And so, you know, yeah. that's the thing is, it's so neat that you're able to use sure foot pads to, um, to then facilitate the process that you're taking the horse through. And it just enhances that process right. because you're working on the structural parts that need to change. And I, right. you know, there's so many people, I look at their horses and I go, oh, you know. It's, if you only could, could affect the horse this way, then the short foot pads would do even more. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because it's all about the positive input from right. the proprioceptors. So yeah. if you're starting with a garbage trim or a garbage shoe job, then, the Sherpa pads are going to overcome a lot of that, but the second the horse walks off of them, they're back to garbage input. Right. So um, it's going to help. It, it helps, and it can start a conversation. Yes, but you have to also work with the structure. So right. what I love is that I can start with the structure and then refine it based right. on asking. Well, and you can questions. have your, your horse owners continually put input because right. some of these habits take time to undo. Right. You know, when you've been standing that way for years, you're not going to just all of a sudden go, oh, I'm fine and everything's great. You know, I mean, no. the body is, it takes time to readjust. The fascia has to change. Every, things remodel. And yeah. so be, being able to use Surefoot to keep putting input into the system to keep inviting it to change. And you can think of it that way. Exactly. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, I read somewhere, this is a question, I read somewhere that rain can make soul softer because the soul can absorb water and become squishy. I guess the question is, is that true? My understanding is yes. Um, the outer wall, uh, Dr. David Hood did a great uh, bit of research on the composition of the foot and how it absorbs moisture. And so what he said is that the outer wall is predominantly lipid bonds and is not water permeable at much at all. However, um, it will um, uptake singlet water molecules suspended in the air as humidity, which is why when we have a really dry summer here, Wendy, in, in our area, um, and, and you compare that to say Arizona, you know, our feet are still not the same because we have humidity and they don't. Oh yeah. Right? Mm -hmm such a difference right so we still get more flare we still get more you know collapse of the foot where they get more block of wood with retained sole and these columnar run forward things it's completely different and it's because of humidity however he did say that the sole will uptake a lot of a lot of water that and that's different. where you get things like contracted soles mm -hmm. right R right or retracted soles but it's a bad yeah, term retracted. but it's what we know of the we think that moisture has a, a part to do with it, but the more I learn about it, Wendy, the more I think that it's actually got to do with systemic inflammation. So when I, cause we see horses with retracted soles that are in dry environments and in wet environments, and it doesn't necessarily correlate. Hmm. 
And we also see like, you'll have 10 horses that have similar breeding, that are eating the same thing, that have the same job in the same environment, and only one will have a retracted sole. And you're like, why that one? And what usually happens is that if we, if we really investigate, they've got something underlying that's keeping them systemically inflamed. Hmm. Like say ulcers, like Lyme disease, tick-borne disease, like uncontrolled uh, low-grade metabolic problems. So when I see a retracted sole, I actually think about subclinical laminitis. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's I know. Okay, we're not going to go there tonight. We no, have other questions. Right. Can you explain the purpose of casting? The purpose of casting depends on the person using it. <laughs> um, you know, what are they using it for? But um, for me, when I use casting, it, I use it as a an attachment method. Like if I'm putting on a glue on shoe, um, a lot of our composite heart bar wide web shoes require either nails or casting to keep them on because the glue bond will break. Um, if they don't have cuffs or something like that. So I use hoof casting that way. Um, I personally don't like using just hoof casting on the foot. I know a lot of people do that, but when I put a prosthetic device on a horse, they usually need vertical depth and hoof casting doesn't provide much vertical depth. So um, I usually do it with a glue on shoe, but you can use it just over a bare foot for protection and, and a little bit of support. There's also some pretty good studies that show that hoof casting, when used higher up on the wall, not like maybe uh, still an inch below the coronary band, below the hairline, you don't wanna get it too high, but there are some good studies that show that it actually um, reduces shear force on the lamini by a fair bit, um, something like 50, 60%. So when I have a horse that has a poor laminar attachment, or I have a horse with a lot of flair, or a foundered horse, those are horses that I like to put in casting in particular because I want to take some share the load over a greater surface area and not rely on the lamini so much because they're not that healthy. Okay, so another question. So you're changing the base that the horse stands on to create a 50-50 and manipulate the breakover? Yeah, but it's all based on the internal anatomy. So 50-50 is, is a goal, it's a guideline. Um, but if you get to 60, 40, 60% support base in the toe and 40% in the heel, because it's a barefoot horse and you don't want to pull the toe back too far because they'll be sore because obviously that's also paramount importance. We don't want to make the horse painful, um, uh, because that's going to create compensation. So that defeats the purpose. Um, but if you can only get to 60, 40 and the horse stands square, then so be it, you know, that's fine. Um, but you need to manipulate the heel support base too. So um, some of these horses I might put in shoes because their heels are too far forward and we need to give them a longer support base caudally in the back of the foot. So yes, it's about breakover, but it's really about the whole footprint, if that makes sense. Yeah, and um, I this is the same person and it's, she's made an addition to add orientation to HPA and COR. And I'm sorry, I don't know what HPA and COR are. Uh, hoof pasture and axis and center of rotation. Okay, right. So what was the first part? Add, yeah, add orientation. At orientation. 50-50. So you're changing the break over to 50-50. The, you're manipulating, you're changing the foot to 50-50 balance to add orientation to the HPA and COR, question mark. Yeah, so the 50-50 is in relation to the COR. So yes, that, that is a direct correlation. The hoof passion axis is actually more based on pitch, which is palmar P3 angle or plantar P3 angle. So the heel height, this way. So hoof passion axis. So yes, if you have a straight hoof passion axis, straight hoof passion axis, and you have a forward hoof print, you're going to get leverage on the toe and maybe go slightly broken back. So yes, moving the, the footprint back and changing nothing else might increase it some, because we see that, but predominantly your pitch, your hoof passion axis is based on the position of your heel and the length of your toe in relation to each other. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, so someone's saying you're talking about soul depth and various pathologies. What are the challenges in getting things right when considering metabolic diseases such as PPID and EMS? 
So um, I did a, a retrospective study that I presented at the um, laminitis conference, the one that Penn put on in West Palm Beach. And I was actually privileged enough to present it there, which was really cool. Um, I studied back in my database, uh, I pulled out um, 110 horses, which was a large pool of horses to look at that all had um, insulin resistance and Cushing's. They all had uncontrolled metabolic blood work at the beginning of, of the criteria in the study. They all had uh, laminitis, chronic laminitis with rotation, some sort of sinking, something, some misorientation of the bone. And they had um, what I would call uh, uh, chronic laminitis subacute. So they were actively painful having a laminitic episode when I started with them. And then um, at the end of the time period that I was following them, I looked at um, the criteria was they were rehabilitated when they had normalized blood work and they had no further distortion in their hoof capsule. So they had straight hoof pasture and axis, um, phalangeal and capsular alignment, and they were uh, sound for purpose, meaning whatever job they had before they foundered, they went back to. So if they were pasture pet, they went back to pasture pet. If they were a hunter jumper horse, they went back to that, so on and so forth. So I had 110 horses I looked at. Of those 110 horses I looked at, I put, how many do you think I put in shoes? Wendy, you have an idea? Ooh, I, I think I remember this study and I'm not about to say. Um, I think you'll know? I, you I think I, I remember this. I remember you talking about this, so I'm not gonna guess. Okay, so. It was like, no, I'm not gonna guess. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, so. Um, to be to be clear about this, I'm going to stop the share for a minute because I want to watch the chat a little bit. Does anybody have a have a have a guess? How many horses out of those 110 do you think that I rehabilitated in shoes? And when you're saying shoes, you're talking talking about gluons. Gluons, like what I did with that horse in the example. 80. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. 33. Hey, who read my study? <laughs> 33. Thanks, 10. Okay, so it was 33 horses. So 33 horses I put in shoes, which means the rest of them I was able to do in my, to get to my guidelines. So I would trim them my guidelines and then work with my veterinarian and manage the environment and diet and all those lovely things to get them as um, healthy as possible. But in the hoof care, we did, in order to achieve those goals, I had to put 33 in shoes. So now the next question is, and this I looked at in my study, out of those out of those horses that were in shoes, how many do you think came out of shoes by the end? Any guesses? And if and Mary Jane, if you read the study, all of them, okay. Hmm. Twenty eight. Hmm. They think a lot of the horses came out of shoes. All right. So the oh, you know. Mary Jane? <laughs> She's stealing my thunder. Um, yes, three. So three horses came out of shoes. That was it. So somewhere in there, I figured out that the ones that needed the shoes for rehabilitation, meaning I couldn't get them aligned in my trim, that three of them, only three of them could come out of shoes. So, you know, when you think about our metabolic horses and achieving these goals, the pathologies can get to the point where they need the prosthesis but they can get back to their jobs. Well, and the other question is, you didn't see what the horses were. Uh, oh, well, you would have seen, I mean, you've already said that not every horse is a perfect foot. So there may have been horses that really would never have been able to be out of shoes anyway, doing it. Right, to begin with. So, you know, anytime you have metabolic disease, anytime you have, um, you know, uh, uh, rotation of the capsule, failure of the lamini, you're just, you're just behind the eight ball. And, the foot is one thing that I feel like changes so much in response to environment and metabolic stuff is hard to control. So therefore we, you know, I control it with the shoe. And I can't tell you if those horses came, stayed in shoes because their owners were anxious to take them out of shoes or if they really needed the shoes. Cause you know, once you get these guys stable, you tend to want to like- Well, I don't mess around with it. <laughs> don't mess around with it. Don't mess with success. Yeah. So. Um, did that answer the original question? I think so. I think um, I did. We have, one, we have one more. Okay, go ahead. Someone, uh, two people have asked, can you explain retracted sole? Oh gosh. Sorry, I opened a kettle. <laughs> it's okay. So we've all agreed we hate the term retracted sole, but it is, 
uh, something that's very characteristic. Um, when you look, when you look at the soul, I can see if I can find a picture here really quickly. I probably could pull up one up. <laughs> yeah, they're around. So when you look at the soul, what's going to happen is you'll see from the concavity of, by the frog apex going forward, it's going to curve up sharply. So it's almost like you think you have a really nice soul callus going around the edge, but you don't. It's actually the soul is compressed and thin. And maybe the easiest way to do this, um, let me just do this really quick. I have a blog I wrote on it. Probably easiest just to show you that. Um, it's called Hoof Love, Not War. And there's two retracted soul articles. I wrote this for um, Easy Care. Um, all right, let me share this with you so you guys can see it too. Okay. Share screen. I love Zoom for these things. Yeah. Share. Okay, can you all see that? Yep. So this is one of the blogs I did, and this was the second one where I kind of refined my opinion about it a little bit. Um, but what, what you can see here is this sole, see how it curves sharply in the radiograph? It curves abruptly at the toe, and it's really hard to get a picture of. You can see it here. It's like, it's like it just, it, it's, the sole is flat, and then it makes this abrupt turn. So those are two examples of it. If you go to the original one, there's more examples there. And horse also looked like his bars had kind of curled over as well. Yeah, I mean, the whole foot just does funky things. So this is, this is a really classic example of a retracted sole. Here where you've got this like divot in the front mm -hmm. where it's shallow around the frog apex. And then you think, oh, look at this nice sole callus. And these horses, you'll give them like a normal style trim and they'll get incredibly foot tender on you or they'll look like they're gonna abscess, but there's no abscess. This is a really classic example of one too, right here. And so, so what are your theories now on cause? It's inflammatory. To me, there needs to be some underlying reason why this horse's foot is inflamed. Because when you put your thumbs on these soles, they're trampoline soles. And when you radiograph them, they are literally a millimeter thick. So it is a, it is a bad deal. If you see a retracted sole, to me, that's a huge red flag. Now the horse is not going to necessarily like all out founder on you. It's not like that. It's like, they've got subclinical inflammation. So inflammation without, um, external symptoms. No, you know, necessarily, although usually these guys will be fairly footy. Right. Right. And so look at this. I mean, there's this, I've even lowered this ridge and now I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't touch that thing because it just, they're so tender on this. It's like the nerves are completely on fire. You can see this one's, this is a different view of an untrimmed one. And it's, you can see that he actually has a crease here. Yeah. And sometimes it looks like they blew a little abscess there. This is another one. Let's see here. This one, this one. I mean, look at that. See how it's like a ridge. Yeah. And they can be more subtle than that. But what happens then is you can see the flattening of the sole under P3. And when you look at radiographs of these horses, 99 times out of 100, they have signs of laminitis. Oh, and Lyme disease can cause obviously underlying inflammation. Yes, really systemic. Is. Yeah, systemic inflammatory response. And one of the things we see is they get, they get a little bit of thickening of the HL zone here, which is indicative of laminar inflammation. They might have a little bit of distal descent. That's what we think the retracted sole is from, is the, the bone is settling into the sole body a little bit, and, and the sole corium is getting pinched. Mm. And you'll see on radiograph, on some of our current radiographs that are really sharp, you can absolutely see the corium on the radiographs, and you'll see the corium is like a millimeter thick, and it should be four or five millimeters thick, mm -hmm. but being compressed. So we used to think it was wet environment, but we've seen enough of it now that honestly, I think it goes hand in hand with the rampant underlying inflammatory things we have going on in our horses. Cause we didn't used to see this. This uh, is like a retracted soul is a recent thing. Like in the last 10 years, we've seen retracted souls. Oh, this is not, I don't remember retracted souls at all when I started working on horse feet. And now they're like, you know, one out of 30 horses has it. And they're always thin and they're always tender and, and it's just a bad sign. 
So when I see that, I tell my owners, even if the horse isn't sore, I tell them your horse has a retracted sole. That's a red flag to me. Um, are there any other symptoms of something underlying that we should bring to your vet's attention? That's what I say. Wow. Okay. Well, I think that answers that question on a not so like a like a yeah. sucked, sucked on a lemon moment. Okay. Yeah, sorry. If you if your horse has a retracted sole, I would be worried. All right. So um let's are we have we gone through your whole PowerPoint? Just about, but there's a couple more slides. Yeah, let's go want. back to something else for a moment. Okay. Yeah, something happy, right? Yeah. Something happy. I know that was kind of a downer. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. That's why I said, oh, we brought up retracted souls. Because it's, it's kind of like talking about saddles. <laughs> okay. So, okay. I'll give you some hope. The okay. One thing you can do if your horse has retracted souls is you can work to protect the tender soul. So while you're investigating the whatever is causing this, and they have to grow out, they don't unretract. So it takes some time. We like to use hoof armor liberally on those guys. So you do one coating of hoof armor and then follow it up with a second coating a couple days later and then a third coating a couple days later to get a nice shellac on that sole, give it some protection. Mm -hmm. You can use hoof boots or glue on shoes. So that you can do that while you're trying to figure out whatever else is going on and waiting for this thing to grow out. Right. Okay. There is hope. Okay. Okay. So we've looked at the cones and where that might put your foot placement. So this is, this is my story of the foot. This is the way Daisy's brain works. Watch out. All right. So the foot is made up of these complex structures that require healthy circulation. The circulation of the foot is an intricate network of blood vessels that is very responsive to load and pressure. Our job as the hoof care provider is to support the healthy circulation in the horse's foot and minimize the impact of compensation over time. We do that by equalizing load on the foot by our trim and our shoeing, working on the environment, and as a team in addressing the whole horse with the other people involved in the horse's life. Mm -hmm. So people say, well, what, you know, what's your goal as a farrier? Well, I'm gonna balance the foot. Okay, to what? What are you looking at? Why are you, why are you taking this away or leaving that? I'm a why person. I have to have a why for everything. Bet they hated you in school. Oh yeah. Well, when do you remember? How long would I spend sitting on my horse saying why? Why? And you're like, just go do it and feel it. Just it's experiential. Just go do it. Right? That's true. I forgot about that. <laughs> I I'd like analyze everything. Well, why are you, why are you putting those wedges on my stirrups like that? And you know, why? Why, Wendy? So I like why, and I, and I have a very different answer to why I approach the foot the way that I do than, than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to challenge farriers when I meet them. So, you know, what's your approach to the horse? What's your goal? Oh yeah, this is what I'm doing. It's like, mm, okay, here's my answer. And then we have great conversation. It's fantastic. Yep. Okay. That's it. We were really at the end. Awesome. No, that was great. It was great to come back to that. Cool. Such a cute pony. <laughs> He's a good boy. Yeah. So, you know, I hope, I hope this has been fun. I enjoyed putting it together, you know. Oh, it's, it's been awesome. And it, you know, it's, uh, I always learn something and, you know, so this has been great and I want to thank you so much. And I'm sure everybody else that has hung in there with us really appreciates it. And yes, they do. There's lots of thank yous coming in oh, good. In the there. Um, uh, and somebody else says, I've gone through a lot of vets asking why. <laughs> yeah. Um, Keep is, asking why. They may not yeah. be able to tell you, but you know, the sign of somebody who actually knows something is when they tell you what, that they don't know. You know, we don't all know everything, but if we're willing to say what we do know, then we can have a conversation and make a difference. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wendy, thank you for asking me to do this with you. This is really a blast. I always enjoy our conversations. Oh, somebody's asking about your online course coming soon, but you have online courses. Yes. Yes. So my my uh, trimming course, which is labeled as a beginning trimming course, but if any of you are in it, you know that it is far from basic material. It's, it's easily explained for everyone to understand, but it is, I can't, I can't make it too simple because I feel like that's cheating the horse. So um, that is on my uh, school website now. It was on Patreon, but we moved it off of there because the platform didn't, didn't work well for it. 
So we have it hosted now on my um, Integrative Hoof School website. And um, you can pay for individual modules. You can subscribe to the entire course and pay up front, or you can um, do a monthly pay as you go sort of thing. And you have access to it for a year. And then if you want to stay in it, it's only $25 a month forever once you've gone through the whole course and you can bounce around. So and I'm adding content constantly. Um, it's not static. I keep adding to it. Yeah, I know somebody's saying it's super intense and excellent. I hope it's not too intense. I mean, you know, like I want well, to very have... transferable to the real world is what they've said. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, and then I also have my Patreon blog, which right now is just a blog. It's um, inexpensive, $10 a month for case studies, $25 a month for uh, the case studies and how to videos. That is actually going to be changing soon because I'm designing an advanced pathology online course. And I'm going to start putting that out here shortly. And the blog will change a little bit just because uh, some of these how-to things I need to go more in depth with for people to really understand them. So, um, but that's all available right now. And I've, as always, I'm always happy to answer questions. Feel free to reach out to me. I, I love helping everybody. Cool. All right, Daisy, just unshare your screen and we'll, we'll okay. bring up here. Up share. Uh, somebody's saying Patreon is amazing. Oh, thank you. I greatly appreciate that. No, it's great because you can, you know, the, the knowledge can get shared. And that's the one thing, I think the one thing about the pandemic that's been really helpful is it's gotten people to get online to realize there's a lot of education available and like these webinars, just a lot of information available and to learn about other people and what's going on in the world. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that is really a blessing in disguise that, you know, I wouldn't have time I've wanted to do online courses and webinars and things for years and years and years and just never really had the time because I was traveling like you do, Wendy, and doing, you know, uh, teaching all over the place and working on horses. And now I actually have the time to, to do this. And it's really been fabulously fun. Yeah, no, it's great. Well, Daisy, I want to thank you so much. As always, it's been a pleasure. And it's and um, you know, I, I like I said, I've learned a lot and is really appreciate your willingness to share. And um, I know everybody out there has, has really appreciated the information as well. So everybody just remember, you can find this in all the webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. We've now got three with Bob Bowker. They're two hours long. I'm just warning you, Bob's are all too, of course this one's two hours long, I think. I know. Yeah, um, but you know, the time flies and you can always listen to a lot of these webinars. We're putting them up um, as audio files on Podbean. When you go to Podbean, just, type in Wendy's Winnie's, that's what we're calling them. <laughs> um, and you can listen in your car while you're, you're at the barn. So thank you again, Daisy, just loved it. Really great information. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And tomorrow my guest is Karen Ralph. So I'll see you here at 9 a.m. Okay, thanks. Thanks, bye everybody. Bye. Thank, thank you, Wendy. You.